Okay, so tonight we are going to get into some textual study of the tefillah, which is what we had uh, planned to do, was to get into, pick some key prayers and really investigate uh, the meaning behind it. And the obvious choice of where to begin, as we discussed in the, in the previous uh, class, is from the beginning, in terms of the Sidur, and the most ancient and the most fundamental text in the Sidur that almost everything really hangs from or connects to is the Shema. The Shema is the oldest text that we have in the Sidur because it goes back to Moshe Rabbeinu, it goes back to Moses, it's part of the Torah. And it's made up of three paragraphs that are copied right out of the Torah. There's no addition or subtraction uh, for the most part in these paragraphs. And these paragraphs, particularly the first two, what page is it? Um, it's on page the first time it appears see it appears many times because it's in the morning and evening service of every day so it's in the morning and evening service of the weekday and also Shabbat um, so the first time it appears is on page 31, 31. page 31 and uh, we're going to go through it and, and look at the text and see what the, what the themes are of the Shema because it's such an important it's such a very important text obviously in Judaism not only as a centerpiece of the prayer but it's all over Jewish life, the Shema. We know that. We know that it's on the, in the mezuzah. If you open a mezuzah, that's what's inside. If you open tefillin, that's what's inside. Uh, when people are, God forbid, you know, on, at the end of their life, what do they say? The Shema. When you put children to bed at night, what do you say with them? The Shema. Everything, the Shema is really the thing that uh, you know, defines Judaism in so many ways. So, to, it, unfortunately, so few people really understand more than the first line. You know, and even the first line, maybe they don't understand. So, what what would be, uh, I think, really instructive for everyone is to take the Shema line by line and try to understand what is it, what is it about. And I'm not sure if we can do the whole thing in one night, but we could give a stab at it and see how far we can get. But I will come back. It'll still be there next week, and for many, many millennia after. So. The very first verse, we take for granted what it means. So if I ask you, what does the first line of Shema mean? Without looking at English. Without oh. looking. Okay. Does anybody know? Shema Yisrael, Hashem, Eloheinu Hashem Echad. What does it mean? Hear Israel. Um, um, you got the first two right. No. It's not a Trinitarian religion. No. Um, Right. Shema is the Lord is God, the Lord is one. That's right. God is, or the Lord is our God. Hashem Eloheinu, Hashem is our God. Hashem is one. It's a statement. It's a declarative statement, according to this, right? We're, we're not asking, a, it's not a question. It's a fact. It's not, right, it's a fact. It's Hashem is our God, Hashem is one. That is the most common translation. There is one view different interpretation of this verse, believe it or not. Hmm. And it comes from not an obscure commentator, but probably the most famous commentator, which is Rashi. Yeah. Rashi, the yeah. most famous commentator, yeah. says that the Shema is actually not a statement of fact, but a statement about the future. And what it means is, Hear, O Israel, Hashem, who is our God, will be the only God one day. In other words, it's not talking about right now, it's also true that God is the only God right now. But in terms of human recognition, it's not the only God. If you ask a Hindu, uh, they have many, many gods. This is only one of many. If you ask uh, uh, other religions, there are other religions that include our God, but with others uh, combined. So the, according to Rashi, it's almost like a prayer or a prophecy of the future. God who is our God, Hashem Echad, will be, like we say at the end of Aleinu L'Shabeach, Bayomahu Yihyeh, Hashem Echad, Shmo Echad. We say on that day, God will be one and his name will be one. In other words, what does it mean on that day, God will be one in the future? God is not one right now. He's something else that he's going to... It means that be recognized. Everybody. You mean everyone will be except our God? Will accept God. one God in the world. That's the idea Jews, of the, of the Messiah. The That's, we're, we're doing pretty well so far because the Muslims basically believe in our God too and they're taking care of getting rid of a lot of the, uh, a lot of the dissenters, you know? What? So, you know... <laughs> yeah. So that's true. It's a good, good. It's a good argument. You know, I that's definite. I wouldn't have thought that interpretation, but that's what Rashi says. Rashi says that there's an implicit sense that Hashem is our God, and he he is one, but not yet. He meaning he's not the only recognized God. He will be. Okay, he's meant to be the one and only. 
Is That's how Rashi reads it. Is there a tense or something? That, is there a future well, tense? I would say, yes. So normally, normally in Hebrew, you would have a future tense. So that's why most of the commentaries interpret it the way that we all know it. Hero Israel, God is, Hashem is our God. Hashem is one. It means right now Hashem is one and that's it. But there is this interesting interpretation that it's not just about now, but it's also talking about the future. Now, what does it mean for God to be one? Yeah, it's another question. Time. Right. So we, we, we talked about this in one of the previous classes, and somebody raised the question, and what is an idea, we can, we can throw out what our own sense of it is. What is, an, what is the meaning that God is one? When we say God is one, if somebody yeah, asks you, you you're a Jew, you're a monotheist, what does it mean? We don't have multiple, uh, like Trinity. So one, po- one definite meaning is that there's only one. We don't have multiple. So it's a statement of exclusivity. Okay? In other words, we're not saying, when we say God is one... An aspect of what we're saying is there are no other ones. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay? But that was very reactive. Well, we Historically, it's reactive because there were so many gods. There were so many gods going around. So that this is this, like a it was a very statement. controversial statement. So who do you think you are? You're telling me that those Egyptian gods are not really Assyrian gods are not going to like this kind of a statement. You know, it's the, uh, it, it is a very uh, reactive. Well, there are other possible interpretation could be that, okay, you have your gods and we have ours. Ours is unique and different from all of yours. Right, so echad can also mean unique, which is definitely unique. one of the unique to be yeah. to be unique. Yeah. Like when we say you're the one and only. In other words, there's a sense that there's something unique and distinct about God. Like uh, Jonathan said, he's indivisible is another concept in, in the oneness or the unity of God. Some people don't like the term unity because unity implies that there are parts that are in a unity. Um, so oneness is a better translation, but it's a little more cumbersome to use. It's, all, it's a little more accurate, though. Um, the idea that God doesn't have aspects, that, when we speak, that we can't distinguish in God different aspects. He's indivisible in that sense. Unlike a physical object that we can distinguish different aspects of. Uh, we can talk about the color or the shape or a person. We can talk about the person's body or the person's personality or the person's intelligence or the person's will or the person's emotions. And we don't have the ability to do that about God. I, to, tell, to tell you the truth, every day when I say the Shema, I think of, I, I reinterpret what I, it might be today. Mm-hmm. Every single day, because it has so many diverse possibilities. There's definitely a lot of different, uh, mean, there's a lot of different another, senses to it. Another way to look at it is <clears throat> that, that uh, God, is, God mm-hmm. is something that's utter, utterly knowable and utterly unknowable. The two opposing forces, depending on how you think about that. Now, your, your perception of life in the world, God can be something that you're very close to, and you under, you, you feel that you understand there is a, that God exists. And on the other hand, you know you, you may feel it's something alien and you couldn't, you couldn't unfathomable. You another another way. Understand. Right, both of which are true. So uh, that's certainly true. So to to me, you know, I think my own personal when I say the Shema, if that has any meaning to anyone else, is, is more that, that concept of the transcendence concept. I think echad to me means uh, a oneness of God, meaning that everything else in the world is divisible or reducible to parts in some way, and God is transcendent. He's in a different uh, realm, a different framework that isn't the physical world and therefore isn't reducible to parts. Whatever we're saying, though, is Hashem is our God, meaning we have a relationship with God, but we're also saying something absolute about God. That's definitely true in the Shema. We're, with, no matter what interpretation you take, whether it be the interpretation that God is the only one and there are no others, or that God is unique, or that God is indivisible, you're making one statement, Hashem is our God. Hashem is one. So you're saying something about our relationship, and then saying something absolute. He's the only one. He's the indivisible. He's the unique. He's one day going to be recognized by everybody. We, you know, whatever it is, it's something more universal about God is being said. And that's, of course, the most important verse of the Shema. According to the Halakha, when somebody says the Shema, the most important thing, they have to concentrate on the meaning of that verse. If they have ADHD and after that verse they are thinking about butterflies and what they're, what they're having for lunch, then they still at least got the core of what you need to get from the Shema. That's according to the Halakha. Now, obviously, you're meant to understand everything that you say, but the most important line is the first one. And then we have this little line where we say it softly. 
Okay? The, the line that we say softly. The, the next line, it says softly. See that? Yeah. Softly. Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Vayet. Blessed is the name of the glory of his kingdom forever and ever. Is, a, is really what it... I don't, the translation here is not so good um, on this line. But it's, it's a difficult line to translate. It's something that we say silently or softly to ourselves. Now, the, the re, there's a lot of discussion of why that is. Um, a very simple reason why that might be is that if you open up a chumash, you open up your actual Bible, and you read the verses out of the Torah, it says, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Eloheinu Hashem Echad, V'yahavta et Hashem Elohecha b'chol levavcha b'chol nevshecha b'chol miyodecha. There's no Baruch Shem Kevod in here. It's not in the Torah. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, an, it's not one of the verses. So that being the case, there's a sense that we're inserting something here that really doesn't belong in here. We're not just reading it. If you, look, if you open a mezuzah, for example, it doesn't say Baruch Shem Kippur. It's just the text that's written in the Torah, copied right into the mezuzah. But when we recite the Shema, we add this line. Okay? Now there are two... Why? Oh, ah, exactly, why? Why? It's not enough what God already wrote in the Torah, so why are we adding something in that wasn't written in there? So there are, there are two classic explanations of this. One explanation is more of a metaphysical explanation, and one of them is more historical explanation. So I'll start with the one that's historical that actually Maimonides brings. When he explains it, he gives the more historical explanation. He says that when Jacob, when Yaakov Avinu was about to die, he brought all of his sons together into the room, and he said, I'm about to die. I'm passing on the tradition to you guys of monotheism, what I learned from Isaac, what I learned from Abraham, you know, this family tradition of belief in one God, and I want you to carry it on, but I'm concerned. Maybe amongst you is a person who's not on the derech, as we say. He's not on the right path. He's going off. And you, and he's going to become an idol worshiper, or he's going to become an Egyptian, because remember, ya- Yaakov dies in Egypt. Maybe one of you is starting to say, hey, as soon as dad dies, I'm going to start going over to the Egyptian uh, yeah. worship. Sure. So he says, I want to make sure that that's not true. And according to the Midrash, according to the legend, all of the brothers said at once, Shema Yisrael, hear Israel, because their father's name was Yisrael. That's where we get the name of the Jewish people, Yisrael. Shema Yisrael. Hashem Eloheinu Hashem Echad. God is our God and is the only one and we're, we're 100% with you on believing in the one God. And at that moment, Yaakov was so happy to hear that all of his children were going to stay faithful to this covenant that he said, Baruch Shem Kevod Malchud Olam Va'ed, which is a version of what we would say today, Baruch Hashem. Right? Thank God that my kids are all going to stick with it. Okay? That comes from that's, that's, what the, the, that's the Midrash that, the, that Maimonides quotes as the reason. So he says, because of that, whenever the Jewish people recite the Shema, we also give thanks. In other words, the same... Because what did Yaakov want? Our original father Yaakov, what did he want? To see that his, his descendants would believe in God. And when we say the Shema, what are we showing? It's still coming true. We're still here. We're still declaring it. So we also declare our, the same thanks that he said. In other words, we're, it's like, it's a, almost a meta thanking. We are saying thank you for the fact that we're still saying this after so many years. We're still saying the Shema. We're thanking God that we're still here to say it. We're still here to recite it. So that's one historical reason. Yes? Do you know if the, all the Sido that we have it has it. Yeah, all Sidurim have it. Even going back, way, way back, way back. Going back to Talmudic times, they had it. There was another time that they said this line of Baruch Shem Kivod, which was during the temple service on Yom Kippur. Whenever they would use the name of God, that is the name that we don't pronounce, and we don't even know anymore, this ineffable name of God that only the Kohen Gadol would use and all that and the high, uh, the high priest would use it on Yom Kippur. So then whenever they would hear that, they would say, Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto Le'olam Ba'ed and they would fall on their, on their face and that's when we prostrate ourselves on Yom Kippur. So this was also used in connection with Yom Kippur service. And in fact, in Yom Kippur is the only time where we say it al- aloud. We say that this verse, Baruch Shem Kivod, aloud. One of the reasons seems to be because of that connection to the temple service that we're saying it aloud. But there's another Midrash that says that when Moses went up to heaven, so to speak, to receive the Torah, he heard the angel saying, Baruch Shem Kevod, that was their praise of God that they said up in heaven. And he said, hey, you know, now I know a secret. You know, I, 
Yeah, I, I, I got the uh, back channels, and I heard what they say in the back room about God. I'm going to go use this, not this line. But since it's not written in the Torah, he said, we, we're not angels. You know, we don't really, we can't really, we can only say what Hashem told us to say. We can't say what the angels say. So if we're going to say what the angels say, we have to say it quietly. You know, we have to. But on Yom Kippur, yeah. where we feel like we're angelic, you know, on Yom Kippur, because we're not eating, we're not drinking, we're praying all day. So we can say we're like angels. On this day, we're able to say it. There's another interpretation to why it's not in the Torah, and that is that Moshe knew that Yaakov said it after his sons said Shema Yisrael, and he didn't want to look like he was plagiarizing what, ya- what Yaakov said. No. Oh. So there you go. There's another one. So he wanted, didn't want to, he didn't want to copy a line out of the playbook of uh, Yaakov. And make it pass it off as his own, as his own work. So, uh, so there you go. That some rabbis today could take a lesson from uh, from that ethics. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, but the, but the um, but the concept is either way that there's something about this praise that connects to the to the declaration of God's unity and God's existence. Either it's something angelic or it was something said by Yaakov, which is the reason the reason it's included. Uh, you know, is, is the matter of dispute here. Is it included because we're thanking God for the very fact that we're still here reciting the Shema? <clears throat> or is the reason because we're, we're alluding to some even higher praise of God that we're not even, you know, capable... We're saying on our level Shema Yisrael and then we're alluding to the fact that in the angelic realms there's something even higher that could be said that we're not able to say except on Yom Kippur. We just whisper it. Okay, but either way, the main thing that I wanted to point out is that it's not part of the Torah. It's not written in the Torah anywhere. And it's something that we whisper most of the time, except for Yom Kippur, for one of two reasons. Either because it isn't part of the, uh, the actual text, or because it's something reserved for the angels and we don't feel worthy of saying it um, out loud. Then we get into the next verse, which is really a part of the uh, Shema itself, as written in the Torah, that if you open up your mezuzah, you're going to see in there. Actually, I should mention first that if you notice, it even shows in the Siddur, that in the, in the sentence Shema Yisrael, the ayin and the dalit are large. And that's true even when they're written in the Torah, they're written like that, with a large ayin and large dalit. Okay? That's the way that they're written in the Torah as well. Because... Ayin and Dalit spell Ed. Ed means witness. Because we're testifying to the, to the oneness of God. So there's a, that, is, that is one of the uh, sort of illusions in the Torah. Now we get to the first commandment. So we declare God is one. And then, Very important verse also. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul. And all your might, me'odecha really means might. Some translate it as all your possessions, that it means your, what you have, all your worldly goods. Yes? Excuse me to interrupt. So the, the witness uh, aspect, that's where Islam took it from with the Shahada. I guess, perhaps. You know, they took a lot of things. It's hard to know. But, uh, yeah. So, what, so, the, so the love of God is the first commandment that comes <clears throat> after declaring the unity of God or the oneness of God. And one question that we need to understand is, what does it mean to love God? What does it really mean to love God, first of all? And number two, what is the connection between the love of God and the oneness of God? So I'll ask you a question like this. Let's say a person says, I really love God because he gives me good health, he gives me food on the table, Money in my bank accounts, beautiful children, a nice house, a good job. Is that loving God? Yeah, could be. Could be. So let's say, if, let's say you say to your child, child, why do you love me? Well, because you give me money. Because you gave me a car. You paid for my college. You give me food. You give me a place to sleep. You say, you don't really love me. You love all the things that I give you. It just happens to be for me. Right? But it's not really loving me. That's loving what I give you. So we call that, right, you enjoy it and you realize I'm the source, so you feel love. That's the way a young child feels love for a parent. A young child is, in many ways, a selfish creature, just by nature. That's not, we're not criticizing, uh, that's just the way that they are. So a, a young child, meaning from the age of zero until about 40, 
uh, is uh, very, very, yeah. So the, the, um, the believes, you know, loves their parent because of what they get, because they're because that's how they define good. You're good because you provide my needs. You're bad if you don't provide my needs or you hurt me. So, but really, it's a love of the self. But bottom line is, it's a love of the self because you are loving what you're getting. So we have an, we have a concept of that. In, uh, in, in Judaism, we talk about the, you know, there's a love of ma'ala, which means you love the greatness of God. You don't love what you get from God. There's a difference, okay? In other words, if you love what you get, that's not bad. That's called being grateful. That's not a bad thing. You're grateful to God, but you don't really love God, so to speak, in and of himself because you're talking about what you're getting from God. Okay, but that, that opens up another problem, which is what? If I say to you, if somebody says to you, your, your spouse or your family member, do you love me? And you say, well, or like, remember uh, in Fiddler on the Roof, do you love me? Remember, yes, I've washed your clothes and I do this and I do that. You know, the, the whole discussion of do you love me or not? What does it mean to love somebody? To love somebody, what, 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 he's look, what Tevye is looking for, or what a person's looking for when they ask, do you love me, is do you love me as a person? Right. Not do you love what I do for you, not do what you do things for me, that's very nice, but do you love me? So love has to do with, do you see my qualities, appreciate who I am, what I am? But that raises another question when it comes to Hashem, because what is he? <laughs> right? We, we, you know, we, we know that Hashem is beyond our understanding in many ways. So how do we love someone that we can't know, ultimately? By only by loving his creations. Loving the, so, so we don't want to fall into the trap of only loving what he gives us. Because then it's just loving the self. Yeah. Right? Well, what about if you love, like, you, let's say, you love the, I love the Jewish religion. Right. It's for what it means. Mm-hmm. For okay, so that's that's a different type. We're gonna we're gonna see something like that, something very similar to that. So when it talks about loving God, the very next verses, these words that I commend you today should be on your heart. These words should be on your heart. And what does Rashi say? He actually quotes a, a very famous statement of the rabbis, a very famous statement that the rabbis have in the midrash that says. How do you come to love God? You study the Torah. When you see the beauty of the Torah, you see, then you love God. The analogy that I would give is a person looks at a, a magnificent painting. Okay? Or they look at a magnificent, they read a book that's just an unbelievable book. And then they meet the author and they say, well, I don't care about you. I only liked your book. Nobody would say that. If you see the author of the book... This book was a fantastic book. It changed your life. You would be dying to meet the author. You might never get to meet them. Maybe the author died. It's no longer around. You can't reach them. Whatever. They're not accessible to you. But you read the book and you say, whoever wrote this, is I admire. there's something unbelievable. Whoever made this piece, this artwork on the wall that I saw, you know, I went to, you know, a museum of art and I said, fabulous art. The mind that produced this I'm in awe of that. You know, I, I wish I could get to know that person who did that. Mm-hmm. So that's the way that our rabbis kind of describe. It's similar to what you're saying, uh, Raz. It's similar to that. In other words, from seeing the beauty of Torah, you say, whoever made this religion is amazing. Special. Right? It's something special. That's how a person comes to love and appreciate God, is by seeing his handiwork. So the Rambam goes even further than this. He says, you look at the creation. You look at the stars, you look at the, you study uh, some, if you study a little bit of science, you see the unbelievable intricacy. You know, we can see even just superficially how beautiful, you know, the universe is and how it works. But when you really study it and you see the depth of it and the beauty of the, and the elegance of the laws of nature, then you really are standing in awe before Hashem. And many scientists, even ones who claim to be, you know, atheists, they didn't believe in uh, any traditional concept of God, they still had a sense of reverence for the beauty that they saw in creation. And in many ways, like if you read the way Einstein talks about his sense of awe and reverence for the beauty of nature, he sounds just like uh, David HaMelech uh, writing about it in Tehillim. There's very little difference, except that maybe Einstein wouldn't have identified with a traditional concept of God. But the emotion and the sense of awe and reverence is the same. 
So when we talk about loving Hashem, the Rambam says, you study the Torah, you study the creations of God, you study the hand of God. Yes, you can't know God for who He is. It's not accessible to us. But what you can see is what He produced. And when you can see what someone produced, just like if you read a fantastic, I'm using a rough analogy, a human analogy, but if you read a masterpiece book that just, you could read it a hundred times, it's just absolutely perfect. You, you hear a, a piece of music that's a masterpiece, anything, any creation of a great mind, and you say, if only I could experience that mind directly, Be, you know, if only I could have a connection with what, the source that that came from. I would love to. So that feeling is the, is the yearning for God that is love of God. It's an indirect kind of love, but it's the best that we can have because we can't know God in and of himself. Yes? The awesome feeling towards nature, how is it different from a kid who gets a toy? I mean, it's very solipsistic. I'm not talking about an awesome feeling because you benefit from nature. I'm well, just talking about an admiration. There is, I'm not saying it's Epicurean pleasure, but you're getting this pleasure out of uh, looking at the creation of God, so the production of God. Well, it depends how you look at it. If you're looking at it as admiration, you can enjoy. That's where the sense of love comes from. You want more. You want to know more. You want to discover more. You have a, you have a, you want to, that's what the Rambam says. He says when a person experiences love of God, they want more and more and more. They want to find out more. They want to discover. They want to learn more. They love it. When a person is just enjoying something for the moment, you know, they enjoy it for the moment and then they go back to their, uh, they go back to whatever they normally do. But when they're really engaged, you know, they pursue it endlessly and we see people who are, uh, you know, captivated by it. So what, what's being described when we talk about Hashem is one. Hashem is the one and only. You should love God. What it means is everyone loves something. We were talking about this before. Everybody loves something. Everybody has a passion. Either that or you're dead. You have to be passionate about something. You have to be seeking after something. If you say Hashem is our God, Hashem is one, He's the one and only, He's the unique, then how can you not have a passionate love affair, so to speak, with Hashem? How can you not, how can you not do that? He's the one and only. If you go after money instead, okay, so then God is not the one and only because your object of love is the almighty dollar instead. Or it's kavod, it's honor, it's status, it's something else. But, but you, you, you're hitting on something really critical in the sense that why in America, let's, you know, why is there no passion for our religion? You know, why is, why is it so that people are you know, getting disconnected? But there I'm, is no I'm not so sure that it's in every no, community. No, uh, no, I'm just so. saying, but on the norm in the United States, for example, you know, we see Jews that are... They're not passionate about it. Right, well, that's, you know, true. They, that's true. Well, why not? What, well, because I think a lot them. of it is, uh, oh, I, mean, is... I mean, my guess is, you know, that, that really is the next verse. <laughs> if you, you teach it to your children and speak of it. <laughs> when you sit in your house. Right. When you walk on the way. <laughs> now, when you lie down and when you rise up. Now, when you read those verses, if I tell, forget what we're talking about for a second. If I told you, Speak about this, whatever it is. Imagine anything. What is the thing that fits this description? Speak about it when you sit in your house, when you walk on the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. What am I talking about? Email. Huh? Email. Your smartphone, right? Uh -huh. Oh my no. God. That's no, no, no. It could be. You know, it's like that, that comic I saw the other day. There's a comic of this guy sitting in front of the computer. He says, oh, it's, it's, it's already 1 a.m. I really need to go to sleep. I've got to get off the computer. And then at 3 a.m. he's on the phone in the bed, you know? <laughs> so, no, that's not what I was thinking. What is it describing? It's describing that you should always be in pursuit of, what, of the meaning of it and, and uh, making a, a greater spiritual connection. It's talking about, right, con the constant involvement. And it's specifically describing leisure time. When you sit in your house, when you walk along the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, what's the first thing you think about when you rise up in the morning? Whatever is most important to you. What's, a la what's the last thing you think about when you go to bed? If, imagine when you were in love. If you ever were, if you are, it helps. Um, <laughs> what's the first thing you think about in the morning when you wake up? The love. What's the last thing? Love. When you're sitting at your desk, whose picture is on your desk? 
My it's the dog. people that you love. Your kids, your dog. I th- my father also has the same thing as his dog. Yeah, uh, the, the, you know that picture uh, has a picture of the picture of the. <laughs> you're the dog walker. <laughs> the, the, he wants to know he's going to walk the dog. The picture, the picture of the children, because when you have a moment, when you have a moment of break from work, what does your mind go to? It goes to what you love. When you're walking on the way, what do people go to? Their leisure activities. So you see people with the iPod and this and that. Why? Because those moments are when they go for what they love not for what they have to do for what they want to do okay what they want to do when they have those moments of freedom Free will. so what does it mean teach why do you, why is it that it connects why do you think the torah connects teach it to your children which the rabbis say doesn't just mean your children but anybody whom you influence your students your children and then it's it describes when you walk on the way when you lie down when you rise up when you sit in your house what's the connection between teaching and that well, that's when your mind is able to be free because you don't have other commitments. Well, that's you. You always go to your. Everyone goes to their default when their mind is free, right? To what they care about. When do you do your? People love doing their hobbies and they need to do their work, right? They have right. to do their work and they love to. So, but it's more than that. If you have a passion for your Judaism, your children are going to get that. In other words, that's what it's trying to say. Teach it to your children and speak of it when you sit in your house, when you walk on the way, when you lie there and rise up. What that means is, you want to teach it to your children? This is how you do it. Show them that it's part of who you are. Whenever you have the opportunity, that's where your heart goes. That's where your mind goes. There's a, there's a famous book called The Art of Teaching. It's an old book. It's an old book. But uh, and it, it, it's about teaching. It's not a formal book about teaching. It's sort of like a, it's about the philosophy of uh, being a good teacher. It's a, somewhat of a classic. And uh, the, the, one of the things that I never forgot about the book was it talks about uh, many things, many ideas. But one of them, that if the teacher is not passionate about what he or she is teaching, then forget it. You, you, kids you, the, the kids are not going to learn anything. And when there's a passion, you want to find somebody who loves football? Find a father or mother who loves football. You want to find somebody who loves any kind of thing? Find a father or mother who loved that and cared about it. Didn't throw it, didn't stuff it down the throats of the kids, Roma. but loved it. And, when they, and their love for it and their passion is an infectious type of passion. It gets passed on. And, and children have a very cute sense of authenticity. That's also true. You don't get away with being a, a phony. A blow smoke at them. I knew, it up. I knew a, a rabbi. Years and years ago, I mean, he's still, thank God, alive and well, but I knew him and I knew his children were all adults and they were all religious. And they grew up in a very non-religious neighborhood. This father sort of took pulpits in that, that make Magen David look like B'nai Brak. <laughs> you know? No, really. I mean, in the, in the middle of nowhere, that, that rabbi was the only Jew, per, Jew observing anything. Okay? Yeah. Where? Where was so, it? In the middle of nowhere. It was in New York, but it was way out east of Long Island what? at that time. And before that, he had been in the south and a place where they said, why do you, have a, why do you make a sukkah? What's a What's a, they, they, they didn't know anything. Nothing. So anyway, I asked the kids. I, I asked the son one time, you know, how did it end up? That, you know, you're in the middle of nowhere. You barely, you know, there wasn't really much Jewish education. There was no community. How did you all end up being religious? And he said, I'll tell you why. Because my parents, everything they did, it was sincere. They weren't putting on air. They they really cared about it. When we went out, my mother dressed us nicely and we wore a kippah everywhere. We didn't say, oh, we can't wear. It didn't, they were proud of who they were. They, They loved their Judaism. They didn't, it wasn't anything. There was nothing inauthentic about it. And that was what they got from it. Even though, you know, many people in, a, in a, an environment like that would fall off. But they did not because they saw the passion of their parents in the home. And that makes a big difference. A big difference for teachers and for, and for parents. Modeling that you really care about it. Because if you don't, because the big question that the student will ask is, if you don't care about it, why should I care about it? If the teacher doesn't care about it, why should the student care? It goes yeah. right to the point of assimilation. Mm-hmm. You don't have to... You know, write a, a ten thousand page paper to explain it. They don't get. They don't pick up the the emotional connection from from the home. If they don't, if they don't, there's no reason to go out and not marry. You know, Mayor Kahana. You want. Yeah, Mayor Kahana had a, a a famous chapter in one of his books that was actually taken out of a later edition, but was put as an appendix. But it, he described the assimilation of American Jews in a way that's very comical, but it's also very sad in a way. Um, and he talked about how they commission all these studies to find out why 
why you know the American Jews are assimilating. He's like, but the very people who are commissioning the studies and conducting them are assimilated. So you know what? What do they know? And then and then he said that he gave an example of the the boy who comes home with the non-Jewish spouse and wants to marry this girl who's not Jewish. So the the parents say, how can you do this? All of a sudden they're so upset about it. And the the, the boy says, well, listen, this girl is just like my mother. She doesn't keep Shabbat. She doesn't keep kosher, just like my mother. She, she doesn't have to pretend to celebrate Christmas. She does the real thing. Why, why shouldn't I go for what my parents really, really believe? An extension to yeah. that story, and that is that parents run to the rabbi, and they're ready. Rabbi, it's a shanda. My child wants to marry, marry a non-Jew. You know, the rabbi says, you know, it's a good shit of... <laughs> knowing like, the family, knowing the family, knowing it's a good they, match. How they raise their children, yeah. it's a good match. Unfortunately, uh, oftentimes that, that could be the case. So, the, I often know one thing, like Rabbi Kreiser, or is there something you have like ten children? And I think about that. I don't think about it with your children so much, but I think about that they're in an area that it's really. That, but they don't have an environment, yeah, I mean, supportive environment. Right. I mean, they're very. Isolated. It's all going to be what they get from the home. And, but they don't have any conflict. They don't. They won't. Right. I mean, you do read about people who rebel and run away. Yeah, well, listen, out of, a, out of 10 kids, if you know, yeah, they're not they're all going to turn out exactly the same. Everyone's right. going to be a little bit right. different. I mean, every, you know, it's you so see wonderful. families with ra- rabbis and their kids, uh, you know, and, and not just rabbis, but it's religious people that their kids might all be on a spectrum of their, you know, right. but they, they hopefully stay connected oh, on some level. Right. Yeah. And, and a lot of it has to do with education, but even more than the education... You know, if the parent, like in our society, it's a very affluent society, and even the people who are nominally religious or observant, Judaism doesn't necessarily play a central role in their life. Um, it might just be a social thing. If you go to, uh, you know, the religious communities in, 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 let's say, in Brooklyn and Deal and Teaneck, New Jersey, wherever you are, you see modern Orthodox people who follow the mitzvot, they observe Shabbat, they observe kosher, they keep all of the rules, but their main focus and preoccupation is whatever their uh, business and succeeding in life. It's, and like of, it's cultural. It's, it's cultural. The culture is. Everybody does. Everybody does Shabbat. That's how we grew up. Yeah, so we keep doing it. There are some people not like that, obviously. There's a, thank God, people who study, they go to shiurim, they learn, they care about it, they're passionate about it. Those people have a much better chance of perpetuating Judaism in their family than the people who just go through the motions because when the motions become inconvenient then the kids will leave that behind or when it becomes difficult right now it's very easy for Jews in the United States to have the, to keep their folk ways of, of culture of Jewish culture even without the deeper meaning because they don't need so much passion to hold on to it but you know when the going gets tough that's really when the test Fred, that's the, the test the lines get frayed yeah because then you start saying is it really worth it anymore Okay, and the people who are passionate are the ones who are going to stick with and it. The parents who see parents who just go, who are just like punching the time clock mm-hmm. to do, you know, do the stuff that they're supposed to do, but they don't have any, they don't put any. Uh, why did you say, Pat? There's no passion in it. Right. They just go through the motions. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean anything to the children. They don't make a connection from that. Right. Exactly, and that, that's the big problem. That's the big problem, and they know that that's missing. And so, so we have this idea of teaching, and how do you teach? You teach through loving it. Your loving is the lesson. So if, you were to, if I were to take a, uh, you know, to make a title over this paragraph, of, you know, it would be loving God. That's what it's about. It's about loving God through loving the Torah. And how that love is really what's going to perpetuate your connection to Judaism. It's that passion. And then it says, Ukshartam le'ot al yadecha. You should bind it as a sign on your arm, which is a reference, of course, to tefillin of the arm. And they should be frontlets, uh, whatever that frontlet is, I have no idea. It's a type of crown, a totefet, a type of crown, um, between your eyes. And you should write it on the doorposts of your house and your gates. Now again, what is this getting to? It's all on the same theme. If you love somebody, you 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 have a little necklace, you know, a little locket. It has their, it has them in it. 
right? You have some kind of memento or you wear a ring that reminds you of your spouse or people have charms that remind them of their children. Trinkets. Okay, trinkets, earrings, whatever it is, remind them of children. These are things that, do you really need a reminder? In other words, it's a, no. it's a sort of a circularity. In other words, you don't need, you want to think about them and when you look at it, it intensifies your thinking about them. It makes, about you, them. Feel it makes you feel good. It makes you feel connected. Yeah. In other words, you don't need a picture of your children to remember your children. Of course you love your children, but when you look at it, it helps you to connect and to, to, to indulge the emotion more. And so by having tefillin, what, what the Torah is telling you is you, your love of God expresses itself that you bind it on your arm. It's like a jewelry on your arm. It's like a crown on your head. You write it on the walls, just like you would hang pictures of your loved ones on the wall. You ha- hang the Torah on your wall. That's, that's what you're doing, basically. When you see a mezuzah, it's not just a protective device. You know, people think of it as it's a, some kind of a force field in uh, front of their house. That's not the... If, when you read it in the Torah, you see that that's not the initial purpose of a mezuzah is for protection. You see it's about the love of God. You want to see it's a reminder. It's, it's, a, it's both an act of love to hang the mezuzah because you're saying I want the presence of God and the remembrance of the Torah to be around me all the time. And it's a reminder when you encounter it. When you leave your house, when you come into the house, you encounter it and it reminds you of what's really important at those moments that you might forget. Like for example, I know somebody who in their car puts a picture, has on the dashboard a picture of their children. Why? Their wife made him put it there. Why? Because he speeds too much on the road. So the wife said, I want you to put this picture of your children so when you're about to speed, you remember what's really important. You have children to come home to and you don't want to endanger your life. Don't forget to make it home. (laughs) And that too. So so that, it's it's a similar concept. In other words, you can get lost in things sometimes. So if you, you, so these charms and bracelets and, and these mezuzot are things that Wake us up. They remind us of what's really important at the moments that we might lose our focus. So for all of the passion that we have, everybody needs a boost. Very good. The, uh, one day I was having a conversation about this with uh, a, a, a rabbi. And we talked about... Wait a minute. Get our boost. Uh-oh. Call back later. I will. I will Love right the Lord your God with okay. all your heart. I'm thinking of quitting. It means your intellect. I'll call you right. in, in ancient times, mm-hmm. the heart was considered the right, right. brain, mm-hmm. the seat of intelligence. The mind, right. So it's, it's really saying you, you, you've got to be thinking about these things in order to appreciate it. Right. It's not just a matter of, you know, you don't okay. automatically make a, a, a connection. You make it through your intellect and, and, and thinking about it. And right, your heart, your soul, your, your inner life. Well, there's an emotional part. There's levavcha here, nafshecha. Your soul could also mean your mind. So there's an emotional part. There's, a, there's an intellectual part. There's me'odecha means all your might, but also some say that it means your means. To utilize the means at your disposal. So they say, why does it have that? Because there's some people that, why does it say nafshecha then me'odecha? So the Midrash says something very interesting. It says, why does it say all your life? And all your possessions, because some people would rather give up their life than their possessions. You know, the reality is some people are so attached. They don't want to. So it's all a matter of the individual. But the point is that everything should be devoted to Hashem. Why does it say all your heart, all your soul, all your might or possessions? Because what it's saying is if you really mean Hashem is the one and only, then that means that everything else should take a second, should take a back seat, so to speak, to that purpose of coming closer to Hashem and to, ha- and to developing that passion. So the Rambam also says something really interesting that that is reflected in this paragraph of the Torah, which is he says that a person he says en ahavat Hashem nikshiret belibo shel adam that the love of God doesn't become tied to the heart of a person unless he immerses himself or she immerses immerses herself in it. In other words, it takes effort to get to the point of love and passion for God. If a person expects that they're just going to wake up one morning and feel the passion, that's not going to happen. But when they expose, when they learn more and they experience more of Judaism, that's the key. That's what a, much of the outreach that's done in outreach organizations is just getting a person in the door to hear a little bit of words of Torah. Just to experience a Shabbat. To experience what it's like, it will pull you in. Well, that's what because there's a beauty to it. Me, everyone, I mean, all of the, the, the Chabad's on campus, the Esha Torah, uh, uh, you know, what do they want to do? They want to get you in the door to get you to hear some classes that open your mind. And then you start asking more and you start to thirst for more. 
But to get that initial thirst, you have to first open your mind and, and start to experience it because we're used to a different type. It's like, it's like uh, uh, in other places, some of the rabbis give an analogy. They say that a child, you know, when a child is born, the only thing that it can drink is milk. You know, it doesn't want, you could feed filet mignon to a baby, it doesn't want, right? Not, it could be kosher if it's Bet Yosef, you know, but <laughs> yeah, only the Svar, only Svaradim can have filet mignon, not the, but the, uh, but anyway, the, uh, the, the, it's $40 a pound, though, oh, we're not going to, $40 a pound, well, yeah, well, that's what you call commitment, yeah, yeah. expensive, yeah, so for the, for the kosher filet mignon, it's free, anyway, yeah, but anyway, that's why we're serving tilapia, yes, exactly, <laughs> Five, a dollar a pound. But you're yeah. <laughs> so the so anyway the. But the hot sauce. When it's hard, then it's not easy. You to need to get into it. So one of the reasons why it's hard to love God is he's not such a nice guy all the time. <laughs> no, well, we're not talking about that type of love, but yeah. Uh, okay. No, I mean, I mean, it's very complex to love God. Right. Because he's not. You talked about the. Beauty. Not everything he does is. You mean is like right. the Holocaust? People say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Holocaust is the Holocaust is very important. For in Jewishness, but it does, it's really not very important. You mean any kind of suffering? You mean, you mean in Jewish history or Jewish, Jewish Right. Because so Jewish identity is I mean, affected by that, but right. No, I mean, you say it's hard to so the, the Holocaust is not, a, it's not an event within Judaism. It's like an event in, in Jewish history. Jewish, Jewish history. Okay. Right. But, but I mean, I mean at Sinai. He, he was right. very, he was harsh. I mean the aggressive, the, the, the midat adin, you would say. Yeah. The, ju- words, the judgment. It's not just about God yeah. being... Or, or look at Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is the ultimate and, day where you focus on the punishments of Hashem. And, and, if we proceed with right. the God of history, we right. see a lot about We see negative and, and positive. Yeah, so we, we must love right. him just like you You might have a, a parent who's a real rat, actually. Right. I mean, God, right. God is not a rat. But I mean, you, loving someone, if, I'm, if this is my father, he, I may love him Despite, and in despite right. of the fact that maybe. He's but I think the love of God is rooted in the assumption that God is ultimately good, good and perfect, oh, yeah. but that we don't see in those events. It's very difficult to see. That's why, like for example, the 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 rabbis say that we say when a terrible event happens, Baruch Dayan Hamet, okay. blessed is the judge. When something good happens, you say, Baruch HaTov V'Hametiv, blessed is the good God, He does good things. If somebody died and you said, Baruch HaTov V'Hametiv, they would be insulted. You're saying God is good. For, and you wouldn't say, Baruch Dayan HaEmet, if something good happens. So, but, the, but the Talmud says that in the times of the Mashiach, you're going to say, HaTov V'Hametiv for everything. That it's, everything is good, even, the, even things that normally would seem tragic. Why? Because in the big picture, somehow in the big picture that we're not privy to see now, we would be able to see even things that seem tragic from our vantage point as being ultimately good, but it's very difficult for us to see. So that's the presumption, of course, of, of our religion, that even, in other words, the whole premise of Tisha B'Av, for example, of focusing on the tragedies, focusing on the punishments, is that this is, by learning about those punishments and understanding what went wrong, we can see that is the good of the punishment, that it's going to educate us that we're going to come back. Not that it's some vindictive, like a person can really be made up of bad streaks and good streaks. And when you're subject to the bad, you, you're not thinking about the good. Or you have to separate it out. You have to say, well, I love them despite the bad. Uh, well, whereas with, it, with Hashem, it's not so much that way. He's not a bad, he's not a bad being. Bad being. He's not a bad guy. He's, a, he's ultimately and exclusively and utterly good. But, it's not always but, easy to see that but, or feel but it. But there have been events in history that make us have a harder time seeing. Have a harder time. For sure. Mm-hmm. And, and people who experience things like the Holocaust, many of them struggled with their relationship with God. Eli Wiesel is an example of somebody who went through a lot of evolution on that in his life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and many others have, have had, uh, uh, you know, have struggled with it. And we, we understand the struggle. It's you know, it's very difficult, no matter, no matter how, especially at this stage in history where there are still people who are survivors who experienced it, you know, to try to talk dispassionately and intellectually about the Holocaust is, is an impossibility for us for a long time. Um, it's not like talking about, oh, the destruction of the Second Temple, we could say, well, it was because of this and this and that. But if you lived at the time of the Second Temple and you went to something, you know why your whole family was slaughtered by Romans? Well, you know, they weren't very nice people. Nobody's going to be able to be willing to accept that. But we have or your, your, your family was very good, but because the Jewish people were so bad, you all deserved it. No, nobody's going to want to hear that. 
now we can say that about the people because it was so long ago, but it's too close to the individuals that we know that were good that might have died, or the individuals we know that were good that survived and their families died, that we, that we don't feel comfortable making some abstract, general statement about, about history like that. But so, can I say one uh, sure. comment you meant? Going back to this issue of effort, mm -hmm. this is what this is talking yeah, about. Yeah, investing so, effort. That, so one time, mm -hmm. Rabbi Kreiser <laughs> he gave a discussion on Rosh Hashanah about God will reward you for effort. Mm -hmm. And I personally, I don't know, I felt that was like, went right into my brain. That's why I'm so impressive. But effort, effort. Right, of course, and effort even is Even coming here to this class, we are making the effort. And aren't we lucky? But when I was when I was on the, I, I never finished my filet mignon uh, analogy. I just realized. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's on the same no, it's on the same lines that it requires a certain sophistication, let's say, to appreciate to to have passion about certain things. Let's say to put it that way. So for for a baby, like the analogy being for a baby, the finest thing in life that you could think of will be alien to the baby. They think that milk is the best. For a child, they think that a piece of candy is the greatest pleasure that they're ever going to experience in life. You know, for an, for another kid, it's a video game. You know, the, everything at a stage of life, what they find to be pleasurable is different. So if you take a child, for example, I tried with my kids to expose them to music that I thought was good music, and you know, in childhood, because popular music is popular for a reason because it appeals to people at a lower level that doesn't mean that it's all bad much of it is good but there you know and, and could be quality but could be but um but it's the lowest common denominator but that's why it's popular as opposed to music of a more sophisticated type that it requires years to be able to appreciate that kind of music requires a different kind of um of being attuned so to me um, it's, it's similar with learning Torah or learning anything that for a child to be, to find pleasure in eating, anybody can do that. To find pleasure in playing games, anybody can do that. But to find pleasure in intellectual understanding or spiritual understanding or doing mitzvot, that really requires, uh, a lot of experience, a lot of effort to develop that. The only thing is once you develop it, you're never able to go back. In other words, and that's, that's a good thing about it. In other words, if you've gone, if you've reached the level of appreciating the finest in art or in music, then you can never look at the less fine in the same way. You might enjoy it, but you don't look at it in the same way. And the same is true when you've developed the ability to appreciate the beauty of Torah, the beauty of Judaism, the beauty of the spirituality of Judaism. You can see other beauty in, so to speak, lesser things, but you never see it in the same way. For a person who's locked in the matrix, for lack of a better word, and can only see the pleasures that are simpler, they say, ah, you know, what are you, uh, what, what are you with the spirituality? It's not for me. But if they were to experience it and open their heart and mind and, and start to develop an appreciation for it, then they would look back and say, what were we missing all this time, you know? So that's really what well, the Shema is telling you. You've got to develop true. it. Once you expose mm -hmm. somebody, whether we all of them, I mean, you know, the more you get the door open... Theory, you know, ideally, if Absolutely. you have a good teacher, you, know, you, you want to... The more you're going to want, you're going to thirst how for it. go right. into more religious and a lifestyle. No, absolutely, and, so the, and, and, the, and you grow into it. Exposure, but you've got to be willing. He wasn't, you know, at the level. Who? Esau. Uh -huh. He wasn't able to appreciate... Okay, and maybe so there are a lot of people that are so sorry. right. He was able to, and there's and there's definitely some people like with anything. There are some people who love math. They just love math. Kids, they grow up, they love math, and then other people, they they really don't like math. But what amazing thing is that if you take a kid that doesn't like math and you give him an amazing teacher, you can change that. You can make him love it. And unfortunately, the opposite. You can take a kid that loves math. I'm just using that as an example, uh -huh. and you can give them the worst teacher, and they can end up hating it, even if they loved it before. So a lot of it has to do with the experiences and how their mind was engaged with it. To. It's really true. So some have a natural proclivity, and if they and if they're combined with an um, an amazing teacher or learning experience, they will go to the greatest heights. And other people might not have, but they can be turned on to it. And and this is true for almost any subject, and definitely for Torah. But you need to have 
not only have the willingness, like all of us today, to take time out of our busy schedule and learn, but also have to have the, you know, find those opportunities that are going to be able to open up those windows that we can continue to open and continue to pursue. So I hope that this gave us all a taste of the beauty of the Shema. Next week, hopefully, we'll do the second paragraph.